I'd like to thank both historical societies for the opportunity to be here. And th this is uh, a nice occasion for me personally because Sue's right. These are good friends of mine. Uh, Connie is a new good friend, and I hope to, <laughs> to learn a lot from her. Uh, and Harry Lowe is, is of course, a, a hero and an icon in the, not just in the Asian American community, but the community of San Francisco. And, and after he stepped down from the court, he, has, he provided so much important public service to our communities in not just the, uh, the as insurance commissioner, but as uh, chair of the police commission in San Francisco, and that work was very important to us. And, and Don Unger is, uh, is somebody that uh, many of us regard as the best immigration lawyer in the country. Uh, <laughs> when I was a young legal services attorney in San Francisco Chinatown, uh, beginning in 1974, uh, Don, volunteered at that office to, to teach us immigration law. And so he was my first immigration teacher. And Mike Lee and I were housemates in Berkeley. And so that's enough said, I think, about Mike. <laughs> for, uh, for 350 years after Columbus, Asian immigration to America was virtually non-existent. The United States imposed no restrictions, but Japan, Korea, and China, beginning in the 17th century, actually executed emigres upon their return to those countries. Uh, so, but slowly, Asian immigration began, and <clears throat> Chinese were the first to enter in, in substantial numbers, driven by the rice shortage and, and devastation of the Taiping Rebellion, and drawn, of course, by the lure of gold. Chinese peasants and laborers began making the long history, the long journey, in the, 19, in the 1840s. Early on, Chinese were actually officially welcomed. The simultaneous, simultaneous opening of both China and the American West, along with the discovery of gold in the 1840s, led to a growing demand for and a ready supply of Chinese labor. Chinese were actively recruited to fill needs in railroad construction, laundries, domestic service, and in 1852, the governor of California actually recommended a system of land grants to induce the immigration and, and settlement of Chinese. A decade later, a select committee of the California legislature advocated continued support of Chinese immigration. It reported that the 50,000 Chinese in the state paid almost $14 million in taxes, licenses, duties, freights, and other charges. Drawing praise for their industry and abilities and for their willingness to accept lower wages, Chinese were considered almost indispensable. In 1857, at the Oregon Constitutional Convention, a nativist amendment, however, to exclude Chinese failed principally because they made good washers, good cooks, and good servants. But the fact that the Oregon legislature would introduce anti-Chinese legislation begins to hint at the tension that existed between those who favored Chinese immigration and those who opposed. With the, uh, at the same time, in, in that era, there was anti-Latino sentiment. And Latinos were actually dealt with by a foreign miners tax in 1850 that was directed at forcing Latinos out of the mine work that occurred. And in protest, Latinos gave up mining in California. With the expulsion of, of these Latinos, the Chinese stood out as the largest body of foreigners in California. And in the West, the full weight of prejudice fell upon them. A new foreign miners tax, this time directed at Chinese, was enacted in 1852. Anti-coolie clubs surfaced in the early 1850s, and sporadic boycotts of Chinese-made goods soon followed. In 1853, anti-Chinese editorials were common in San Francisco newspapers. Statutes and ordinances like the 1858 Oregon that required Chinese miners and merchants to obtain monthly $4 licenses were not unusual. The tension between the desire for Chinese labor and nativist resentment of Chinese immigrants is best captured by the commotion surrounding the 1868 Burlingame Treaty the treaty, the treaty between the United States and Chinese governments represents the high watermark of official Chinese acceptance. 
China agreed to end its strict control over immigration and recognize the inherent and inalienable right of man to change his home and allegiance, and also the mutual advantage of the free migration and emigration of their citizens. In discussing the treaty, many writers esteemed the cultural greatness of China. Some US writers wrote, the wrote about the special destiny connecting the United States, the youngest nation, with China, the most ancient one. Others stressed the cultural rewards that intermingling with the Middle Kingdom would bring, noting that at a time when our forebearers were digging for roots in swamps and forests, the Chinese were rich, civilized, fertile in poets, philosophers, economists, moralists, and statesmen. Histories of the policies involving exclusion generally begin with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, but that date neglects earlier federal laws as well as the effect of local efforts that discouraged immigration. In fact, in 1870, shortly after the, the end of the Civil War, there was an extension of citizenship rights to people of African descent in the United States. Yet, in that same session of Congress where citizenship and naturalization rights were extended to, to Af people of African descent, it was specifically not extended to Chinese. Also, responding to local law enforcement claims that Chinese women were being imported for prostitution, Congress in 1875 passed legislation promoting their, prohibiting their importation for immoral purposes. In one case, 21 Chinese women were disallowed entry on the ground that they were lewd, though this action was overturned by the Supreme Court. But the overzealous enforcement of the statute, commonly referred to as the Page Law, effectively barred Chinese women and further worsened an already imbalanced sex ratio among Chinese. Responding to the national anti-Chinese clamor, the 47th Congress enacted the Chinese Exclusion Act of May 6, 1882. The law excluded laborers for 10 years and effectively slammed the door on Chinese immigration. It did permit the entry of teachers, students, and merchants, but their quota was quite small. Eventually, by 1904, the Chinese Exclusion Act was made permanent. 